Welcome everyone to the May meeting of the Caribbean Cooperation Team. I am Judy Lang of AGRA, and I'm delighted that our founding co-host, Noah's Dana Wusenich Mendez, is with us today. <clears throat> our main purpose is to help you prepare for the next bleaching event, which could be as early as this summer in the Caribbean. You'll hear the latest predictions from the NOAA Coral Reef Watch Team, and then experience the lessons learned and next step recommendations while some of the more easily implemented responses were enacted during last summer's horrific bleaching in our region. And finally, for those who can linger on a little at the end, we'll introduce you to a hope spot where large stands of acroporid corals bleached but most have survived and even grown during the last year. But first, it's time to acknowledge today's co-sponsor, the Reef Resilience Network of the Nature Conservancy, and welcome the TNC's Caitlin Lustig, who will graciously act as our primary host today. Caitlin. Thanks, Judy. And thanks to all of you for joining us today for this webinar titled Lessons Learned from the 2023 Caribbean Bleaching Event and Preparing for 2024. This webinar is being hosted by the Ocean Research and Education Foundations, Atlantic and Gulf Rapid Reef Assessment, or AGRA, MPA Connect, NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program, and the Nature Conservancy's Reef Resilience Network. As Judy said, my name is Caitlin Lustick. I'll be the host for the webinar. I'm based in the Florida Keys and work for TNC's Florida chapter with a small portion of my time supporting TNC's Reef Resilience Network. This webinar will be an hour and a half and we've built in two question and answer sessions. Oh, there we go. Uh, we have a great lineup of speakers today with an intro to last summer's bleaching and predictions for this summer, followed by a series of talks about response actions and lessons learned. But first, I just want to start with a few housekeeping items. Please be sure to meet your, mute yourself throughout the webinar. You can use the chat feature if you're having any technical difficulties, such as issues with sound or seeing the slides. And you can also enter questions into the chat box throughout the webinar. So if you have a question about one of the speakers and you don't want to forget it, just throw it in the chat box. We'll be monitoring that throughout the entire webinar. Um, and we will have two Q&A sessions, one after the first speaker and then um, a more robust one at the end. And then also during that designated longer Q&A session at the end, you can also raise your hand and we'll call on you and you can ask your question um, yourself. So I'm gonna pass it over first to Dr. Derek Manzello. He's the coordinator of NOAA's Coral Reef Watch program to talk a little bit about what we saw last summer and what we can expect this summer. Derek, I'm gonna pass it over to you now. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Um, I'm gonna to attempt to share my screen. Hopefully it lets me hear. Hmm. So why, there we go. All right, so does that look good? Can everyone see that? Yep. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, all right, thank you so much um, for the opportunity to talk to you all here today. Um, so I believe many of you are likely aware that uh, on April 15th, NOAA made the official announcement that we are unfortunately in the midst of the fourth global coral bleaching event on record. Today, I'm going to talk to you about that, um, as well as uh, prediction, predictions for the Caribbean uh, summer of 2024. Uh, just so we're all on the same page, <clears throat> Coral Reef Watch instituted uh, new alert levels last December. Um, and the reason we did this is because as of about October of last year, pretty much the entirety of the wider Caribbean uh, just was blanketed in this dark red, which is what we used to call alert level two. Um, and the old definitions are up there on the left. So basically, Coral Reef Watch used to say we expected significant bleaching uh, from four to eight degree heating weeks and severe bleaching and significant mortality uh, at greater than eight degree heating weeks. So this wasn't really doing a good job of reflecting just the uh, magnitude of the heat stress that had accumulated as well as the kind of... Uh, variability uh, from place to place. So we put in three new alert levels. 
uh, and parameterize these based on literature responses of corals uh, around the world to different levels of thermal stress. Uh, the kind of upper limit, the bleaching alert level five is based on the response of corals that have experienced degree heating weeks in excess of 20. So this has happened four times. Uh, the first time was in the Galapagos Islands in 1983. And then it's happened a couple times in Kiribati and once in Jarvis. Um, and then in those examples, uh, coral mortality ranged from 89 to 90, or excuse me, 89 to 99%. So a bleaching alert level five is what, you know, akin to a category five hurricane in that this is really a worst case scenario. And this is when you can expect uh, essentially a risk of a near complete mortality uh, at your reef. So taking a step back to bleaching alert level four, this category is based on what happened to the Virgin Islands in 2005. So it experienced about 15 to 16 degree heating weeks and saw about a decline of about 60% in coral cover. Uh, and then bleaching alert level three is just the, you know, the logical intermediary between our slightly revised alert level two um, and alert level four. So I just want to point out that <clears throat> this doesn't mean that alert level two should not be uh, considered seriously. Uh, and the reason I say that is because we know that heat sensitive species like acropora are, you know, very sensitive and they still suffer dramatically uh, at alert level two conditions and can experience rapid and severe mortality. Also, when a reef, this, I guess this isn't really relevant for the Caribbean anymore, but um, when a reef experiences its first severe mass bleaching event, uh, you can see very drastic and severe mortality at alert level two conditions. Um, a great example would be uh, what happened on the Northern Great Barrier Reef in 2016. So this picture shows you the maximum degree heating weeks that have accumulated around the globe uh, since January 1st, 2023. Um, and you can see the Caribbean and the uh, South Atlantic have been really getting the worst of this. Now, if we show the same picture in the space of the new bleaching alert areas uh, and showing you with little stars where bleaching has been confirmed, um, you can see that we've now confirmed uh, mass bleaching in at least 57 countries and territories. Uh, we just learned about bleaching in India and Thailand uh, within the last week and a half. So those are the most uh, recent entries into that list. Um, and in addition, uh, they're closing Pling Island and Phuket uh, to tourists to in an attempt to minimize the damage from the coral bleaching that has just started there, unfortunately. <laughs> so this plot shows you um, <clears throat> Maximum degree heating weeks that have occurred since 2023 minus the previously maximum value of degree heating weeks experienced around the globe. Um, and the take home message here is that unfortunately this event is just wreaking havoc in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, you know, if you look at the Caribbean and you look there around Jamaica, basically what that's showing you is that, you know, areas around Jamaica have experienced more than 12 degree heating weeks more than they've ever experienced before. So that, I mean, that's, that's essentially the, the magnitude of an alert level three stress packed on top of whatever degree heating week stress this site experienced before. Um, Southern Garrett Great Barrier Reef also, also experienced record setting heat stress uh, as did some parts of the Seychelles. Um, unfortunately, American Samoa is right smack dab in the center of that big, uh, you know, yellow, uh, red, central south pacific plot and is also experiencing record setting heat stress so if we rank the four global coral bleaching events uh, we can look at this thing called the global coral bleaching event index that was developed by william skirving and essentially this is simply uh, a measure of the percentage of reef pixels that have experienced bleaching level heat stress in the last 365 days so the way to look at this is this is the percentage of reef area around the planet that has experienced heat stress that we know can, uh, elicits mass coral bleaching. So the first global bleaching event peaked at 20%. The second one in 2010 peaked at 35%. The gl third global bleaching event, which lasted for three years, peaked at 56.1%. And as of May 10th, uh, we are at 59.8% and growing uh, still. So what does this mean? Well, during the 1998 global events, estimated that about 8% of the world's corals died. And then there was a further 14% loss from 2009 to 2018. And just to hammer in this home, you know, or hammer home this, this, uh, this fact is that the Atlantic Ocean in particular is experiencing the brunt of this event. And pretty much everywhere that 
there are corals in the Atlantic Ocean has experienced bleaching level heat stress. So the four month uh, coral bleaching outlook product, uh, you know, basically it's showing progression of heat stress in the central western Pacific and Indian Ocean uh, as the planet continues to rotate towards Northern Hemisphere summer. Uh, and we're starting to see it uh, predict uh, bleaching level heat stress for the Caribbean. Uh, so currently the outlook is showing that uh, towards the end of June, we can expect alert level one conditions for the Southern Caribbean. So Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panama, and Colombia. Uh, and then that heat stress is predicted to creep in the, the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef um, in early to mid-July. And then by August, the Lesser Antilles are anticipated to experience alert level one conditions. And then by mid to late August, Florida and the Greater Antilles. Um, so right now, the forecast is suggesting we will experience uh, bleaching level heat stress in the wider Caribbean this year. Um, and, uh, you know, I will point out that this forecast product is, is really good at predicting essentially the next month or six weeks of stress. Once you get further out, the, the skill or the predictive capacity of the forecast declines. So things can change. I hope they change, but this is where we are right now. Good news, El Nino is going away. Um, we're transitioning to ENSO neutral like right now. Uh, and La, La Nina is expected to develop uh, by July through September with a 69% chance. Um, but this doesn't mean we can basically, you know, give up, go home and say, up, oh, all is well in the world um, because the ocean is still running a very serious fever right now is what I've, what I've been saying. Uh, so this plot shows you uh, sea surface temperature relative to average conditions around the globe. And, and the take home message here is everything that's yellow or orange is uh, higher than average temperature for this time of the year. Now, the good news here is we see the characteristic of La Nina developing that uh, cold blue tongue developing uh, in the Galapagos and, and propagating west in the equatorial Eastern Pacific. That shows us that La Nina is on the way and that is good news. Um, but we need to be aware of the fact that mass bleaching is now occurring during all phases of ENSO. Coral uh, Great Barrier Reef experienced a mass bleaching event in 2022, which was during La Nina. Uh, and this is likely because ocean temperatures have now warmed to the point where large scale bleaching now occurs out of phase with El Nino. Uh, so we definitely need to be, you know, keeping our eyes open even when it's not an El Nino state. So something that I've noticed in the last couple of weeks that is really concerning me at this point is that uh, we're already starting to accumulate degree heating weeks in the Southern Caribbean. Um, and this is unprecedented. There's that word again that I'm really getting sick and tired of using. Um, and if you look here, this shows you uh, daily sea surface temperatures for the entire satellite record there on the bottom are the degree heating weeks. And the take home message here is we're accumulating degree heating weeks at these places earlier than has ever occurred before. That dark gray line down there at the bottom clearly shows you that 2023 was a record setting heat stress event in terms of degree heating weeks. Well, that black line shows you that degree heating weeks are already accumulating. And this is a good, you know, six weeks earlier than has ever occurred before there on the Caribbean side of Panama, in particular in the uh, Boca del Toro region. So in summary, uh, severe coral bleaching has been reported from at least 56 countries and territories since February, 2023. Uh, we're right about uh, the point where 60% of the world's coral reef, area, reef areas experienced bleaching level heat stress in the past year. This is a record and still increasing. Uh, it's gonna be some time before we know the full ramifications of this event. Um, we already know there were severe impacts to a cropper in the wider Caribbean, unfortunately. Uh, and the first publication on this event has already come out from the Mexican Pacific uh, off of Wutolco in Oaxaca. Um, this area experienced alert level four conditions and unfortunately uh, mortality across the reefs in that region ranged from 50 to 93%. So we need more monitoring data during bleaching and one to two years after the heat stress subsides. This will allow us to identify resilient reefs, species and genotypes and provide us a blueprint for how to save more corals during the next inevitable bleaching event. Uh, finally, these are strange days for global ocean temps. This is a plot showing you uh, basically a different satellite data product, but you know the black line is the uh, sea surface temperature values on average for the entire global ocean in the top, and then on the bottom is a North Atlantic sea surface temperature daily average. Uh, and you can see that 2024 is above 2023, which is concerning because 2023 was insane. 
Uh, if there's any good news, we can see that black line down the bottom kind of creeped back into the, the same level of uh, the 2023 event, but it's starting to creep back up again. El Nino is uh, going away, which will help hopefully bring down that percentage of reef areas that have experienced bleaching level heat stress. But again, the ocean is still anomalously off the charts, once again, using these phrases, hot. And uh, this means that it won't take much additional heat stress to push things over the uh, bleaching threshold this summer in the Caribbean. Uh, just finally, I like to throw this out. You know, it's important to understand the timing of subsequent disease and corallivore outbreaks. Because as we know in the Caribbean in particular, a lot of the corals can survive the heat stress, but they later will die from disease outbreaks or predation. Um, so, you know, something as simple as picking snails off of recovering corals could prevent a local extinction. Uh, I'd like to call out the Coral Reef Watch team for all the excellent work they do on a daily basis. Don Lou, Jackie Del Corey, Eric Geiger, William Skirving, Blake Spady, and Andrew Nori, and thank you very much. I think I only went over about two minutes, so thank you. Thank you very much, Derek. And we do have time for questions, and I'm hoping that you'll get some. Um, while we while we wait for hands to come up or something to appear in the chat. So I'd like to ask you a, um, a question, which is last year's bleaching event definitely started in the southwestern, western Caribbean, and then moved north and east and came down to the southeastern Caribbean. And it seems to be heading in the same direction this year, except that already the almost the entire Caribbean basin is already um, warmer than it was last year at this time. I, I remember bleaching of big bleaching events in the Caribbean in the past in which the major hotspot was off to the east in the Atlantic Ocean and then moved over the eastern islands of the Caribbean and the northeastern parts of the Caribbean. And I'm sort of wondering if you know there's any explanation for these different behaviors and or is it just all too complicated as the ocean warms and the El Nino's come and go? I mean, that's a really, really great question. Um, you know, I'm hoping that somebody's looking into that in terms of the spatial patterns. Um, you know, I think it's a little outside of my wheelhouse as a, you know, a biologist, ecologist. Um, I think that's probably something for a, you know, a physical oceanographer uh, would need to address. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right, you know, Last year, the first places we saw bleaching pop up were exactly where the degree heatings are accumulating right now. So Boca del Toro in Panama, you were kind enough to pass along those bleaching observations last at the end of June last year. And then, you know, Belize and Mexico basically lit up at right around the same time. Um, so yeah, you know, the 2005 bleaching event was basically a huge blob of heat stress that was parked right over the US Virgin Islands, a little bit to the Northeast whereas the rest of the Caribbean was kind of spared. Not, um, the, not, not the southern eastern, not the southeastern Caribbean. Mm. But the, the lesser Antillean islands were, right. really, were really impactful. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, this could just be, you know, bleaching, you know, bleaching event to bleaching event variability. That's natural. You know, I'm curious to see if there are any kind of climatic drivers or, you know, AMO factors or things like that that are, that are factoring into what we're seeing, or if it's just, you know, chaos of the, the global experiment that we're, we're all, you know, participating in right now. Well, I hope you know somebody. Um, there's a big question for you in the chat from Rowan Martindale. Do you want to ask that, Rowan? Sure, I can. I don't know why my camera's not working. There we go. Uh, hi, Derek. Thanks for the nice update. I mean, not nice update. Uh, one, one of the questions that I've been getting a lot from people, and I don't know that I have a good answer, is just what made 2023 just so much worse? I mean, I know the last decade has been going up and up and up, but 2023 just seemed to like kick it up a notch in terms of the degree <laughs> heating weeks. So do we have any idea climatologically or oceanographically why that was just so much worse? So yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so what's going on right now and what started in 2023 is, you know, it, it's well in excess of what has been predicted based on climate models and forecasts, right? And, and climate models and forecasts have gotten really, really good. You know, we have really, really good supercomputers now and we've gotten really good at 
modeling the climate. So what the hypotheses out there for what we think is going on, again, I believe these are being tested right now. I don't think any of this has really been nailed down uh, you know, with any publications, but the hypotheses are that what we're seeing may be a result of additional factors on top of El Nino and climate change, right? So you have the climate change signal, El Nino adds like, you know, another degree to that or whatever, or less. Um, but the big thing was the, the volcanic eruption in Tonga in 2022. So normally when you have volcanic eruptions like Mount Pinatubo in 1991 and then Krakatoa back in the 1800s, usually volcanoes, when they erupt, cause global cooling because they're ejecting all these particles into the atmosphere. They reflect the sun, they cool off the planet. Well, this volcano was a submarine volcano, so it ejected tons of water vapor into the upper atmosphere, which acts as a greenhouse gas. So it is hypothesized that the Tonga volcano, as well as the new uh, international laws reducing sulfur compounds in marine shipping fuels, uh, may be contributing to this, this insanely anomalous heat stress we're, we're experiencing. So, so the, the sulfur story is that you know, marine fuels used to have these sulfur compounds in them that were, you know, horrific for health reasons and everything else, but they actually acted as cloud condensation nuclei. So, you know, when you had ships going across the oceans, you see these little trails of clouds after them. Um, so that was reflecting sunlight. So there are additional factors uh, on top of climate change and El Nino that are likely driving this insanity that we're seeing. And, you know, maybe I'm delusional, but this gives me hope that <laughs> What we're seeing right now is not the new normal. This gives me hope that, you know, I think the estimates are like maybe if it is excess water vapor in the atmosphere that's driving this, that that'll dissipate within five years. So, you know, fingers crossed that this is not the new world we're living in. Um, and, you know, hopefully that this is being exacerbated by other factors that will lessen with time. Thanks. Thanks, Derek. That was great. I think I'm going to suggest that we move on to the next speaker so we have plenty of time, but then we're going to track the questions in the chat. And if we have time in the second question and answer session, we'll bring these back up. Sound good? Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay. So following last summer's bleaching event, we asked the reef management community in Florida if they wanted to host a webinar on Florida's response um, as a reef resilience network webinar. Um, and they indicated that they first wanted to have the thoughts compiled in a lessons learned document. So Maurizio Martinelli with Florida Sea Grant and I worked together through Florida's Coral Reef Resilience Program to compile the different actions that were taken this past summer in Florida and the lessons learned. And we compiled them into this document that I'm showing here. It's available to anyone who wants to access it. We plan to treat it as a living document so it'll get updated over time, um, likely this coming summer. Um, and I'm gonna use the information in this document to frame each of the presentations that we're gonna hear uh, throughout the day. And we'll make sure everybody gets the link to this um, following the webinar. So I wanted to start with some high level takeaways uh, that we compiled into this document. There's a lot of them in the document, but I tried to boil them down and focus on ones that would apply anywhere because there were some that were pretty specific to Florida. Um, so the first one is to have a plan ahead of time. And this doesn't need to be anything complicated. Um, it could be something that comes out of a meeting with the reef managers and practitioners, but it should consider triggers for action that allow managers and practitioners to make decisions quickly about what action should be implemented and when and where. Um, once those actions are identified, uh, consider up obtaining permits preemptively to avoid lags in action in the middle of the emergency. Um, so in Florida, some of the practitioners have decided already what they'll do this summer, um, and they're getting those permits now so that they'll be ready to act as soon as they need to. Second, prioritize protecting genetic diversity over biomass, and you're going to hear this one over and over again throughout the other presentations. Uh, focusing on a smaller number of corals allows for a higher level of care and is more manageable to plan for. Oops, sorry. Act early before seeing obvious signs of stress. Many of the actions that were undertaken, at least in Florida, occurred after corals started to pale and bleach. The stress of transport on top of the stress that they were already um, having from the, from the heat resulted in higher levels of mortality of certain species. 
Uh, there's evidence to show that no matter what action you're implementing, it generally has a higher rate of success when started before the corals are showing obvious signs of stress. Uh, the next one is monitor as much as possible to understand long-term impacts, and this could apply to nurseries, outplants, and natural reefs. Understanding how these events affect corals, genotypes, and communities can help inform future actions. Build redundancy into programs where possible, hold individuals of the same genotype in more than one nursery or outplant them to more than one reef in order to spread the risk of losing an entire genetic line in one, one event. And finally, communicate frequently. This applies to across management agencies, across practitioners, between agencies and practitioners. Um, and the purpose of this is to help share lessons learned and resources when needed. Um, and so now I'm gonna introduce each of our speakers along with a quick intro into each of the topics that they'll be covering. So first we'll hear about nursery shading from Dr. Carlos Toledo Hernandez in Puerto Rico. Some key consider considerations when applying shading to corals include that shade should be deployed in advance of thermal stress. Again, you're gonna hear a lot of these bigger lessons learned over and over again. Um, they do need considerable maintenance because they attract fouling organisms and trap sediment. So they need to be cleaned frequently and also buoyancy needs to be checked frequently if they're um, on a floating structure. They also should be removed for tropical storms or hurricanes to avoid damage, which could result in marine debris. And research shows that there may be no difference between shading corals all day or just for the approximately four hours when solar radiance is highest. So that could be useful if you're visiting a nursery or a site every day. Um, and there's a way to do some temporary shading, those could be applied just in those hours that you're in the nursery and then removed each night. So I'm now gonna pass it on to Carlos. Thank you, everyone. Can can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Right. So I'm Carlos Toledo Hernandez. I'm a research associate at to the Sociedad Ambiente Marino. We are a nonprofit organization based in Puerto Rico. And today I will be presenting the result of a preliminary study aimed at reducing the stress, the heat stress on corals that uh, during the farming stage. Um, this project was conducted in collaboration with Dr. Claudia Patricia Ruiz and Samuel Suleiman, both of which are also research associated to the SAM, to the Sociedad Ambiente Marino. Next slide, please. So this idea arose during the last summer mass bleaching events in, where uh, nearly 80% of, of uh, coral reef in, in Culebra, Puerto Rico bleached, including corals that were uh, placed in farms, as you can see in the pictures. And during that bleaching event, close to 20 to 25% of these corals uh, perished due to this bleaching. Next, please. For this pilot, uh, next, that's the experimental uh, uh, design. For this pilot study, we use uh, six horizontal floating frames, two of which were shaded by placing a translucent vinyl sheet on top of the of a farm. And other two frames were um, shaded by placing green cloth shade or satin mesh. And the other two uh, farms were uh, uh, were not shaded, so th these were the controls of the of, of the experiment. Um, we placed three of these uh, farms in a water depth of six meters. So three farms, one control, one clear, and one green farm shed was placed in a six meter water depth, and the other three uh, farms were placed in in a six meter of water depth. So overall, we use uh, 484 acroprosa recording fragments. Uh, it was like 69 to 91 uh, fragments of acroprosa recording per farm. 10 fragments per farm were tagged and they were followed through time to uh, determine their growth. We also include in at each farm's one device that, that measure temperatures on, and solar radiation. And the experiment started in September of 2023 and ended up in February of 2024. So the corals that we use for these experiments were already stressed. Next uh, slide, please. So this is how they look beneath the, the corals. They're, they're 
first images are the control farms and clear in the middle and green shaded farms in the right hand of this uh, slide. Next, please. So these are the results of the temperature uh, in the farms. The first, the top figures are the temperatures from the deep water farms. The bottom figures are the temperatures from the shallow farms. And from left to right, the first row are the controls. The middle figures are the clear shaded farms and the green shaded farms are the ones at the right hand side of the image. And if you can see, the temperatures follow a seasonal pattern, high temperature during the summer and decreasing in the winter. But what I want to stress here is that uh, next, uh, there's uh, some animation here. You see that the shaded, shaded uh, farms were, uh, the temperatures within the farms that were shaded were relatively lower than the control. So we were able to reduce the temperature just by shading the farms. Next slide, you'll see that the, this just uh, next, you'll see the difference in, in, in uh, average between the uh, shaded farms and the control. Next and next. All right, next slide, please. Uh, this, uh, this slide shows the lag intensity results and the uh, distribution of the figures are the same as the temperature. And if you can see, um, the light intensity was dramatically lower in the deep, uh, far, uh, deep, deep farms when compared to the shallow farms. But I want to stress that within the shaded farms, the light intensity was very, very light in, in comparison to the control. So you can uh, uh, press next like six times so that people can see the, the average. Next slide. These are the uh, results of the growth rate. The first figures from left to right are the uh, growth of the uh, fragments in the deep area. And the right hand side are the uh, results from the growth rate of, of the shallow areas. And if you can see, if you can notice, growth was higher in shallow areas when compared to deeper uh, reef. So going back to deep, you see that the green shaded farms show higher growth than the control and the clear shaded farms. This thing, bottom what's observed in shallow areas, you see that control, fragments from the control um, farms were very similar to growth from the green shaded farms. So we were able as well to um, uh, e equalize the growth rate uh, uh, in the green shaded farms when compared to the control. Clear shaded doesn't look that good, but uh, the, the corals within these uh, farms also grew. Next, please. Next slides, please. So these are the mortality records and I wanna stress, next, I wanna stress uh, the, the survivorship of in within the green shaded uh, farm. You see that the mortality in overall was fairly low, but it was dramatically low in the green shaded farms when compared to the control. Um, so shading with the green, with the uh, uh, Saddam mesh does uh, prevent mortality. We have a like, sort of a mixed results in the clear shaded farms because in, in one of the farms in the shallow areas, we have very low mortality, but in the deeper, uh, area, we have a relatively high mortality or similar mortality to the control. So uh, we we think that the, that the reason for that is because of the, you know, the, the, these corals were, were already stressed. And so they were, you know, perhaps it, it was inevitable for them to die anyway. So uh, next slide. For future project, we would like to expand the shading to outplanted corals including other corals that are, or, or uh, corals that are, have not been planted, but we would like to shave them just in case. We would like also to increase the number of farms with more shades. Uh, uh, so we would like to improve by doing that, the, their survivorship. We will also like to um, study their effect, the effect of shading at the physiological level 
we would for that we would uh, measure some sort of protein like fluorescent protein and other proteins that are associated with heat stress, heat stress, and we would like to compare uh, the shading. We would like to play with the shading, place intermittent shading to the corals and permanent shading, compare these uh, these uh, these shading and non shading effects at the physiological level. And lastly, next please. I would like to, next, I'm just finished. I would like to express my gratitude to these people. These are uh, people from Culebra, volunteers, fishermen, and, and uh, students from the University of Puerto Rico or other institutions, private institutions that were instrumental in the gathering of, the, um, of our results. And thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos. That was great. Um, just as a reminder, we're going to do questions for all these at the end, but feel free to put them in the chat throughout um, the presentation, and we'll make sure we get to them at the end. So the next person that we're here, we're going to hear from is Simon Walsh on a few different actions he took to protect corals in Dominica. One of these actions was nursery relocation, so I'll share a couple key considerations about that. Um, the first is to focus on, again, founding populations, a few representatives of each genotype or a percentage rather than focusing on the full biomass um, of a nursery or restoration program. And then second, corals should be moved from areas of heavy impact to those of less impact. And that can be based on either bleaching projections or local knowledge of the reefs. Simon, go ahead. Yes, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Simon Walsh uh, from Dominica, and uh, I am owner of a dive shop. Uh, I'm not a marine biologist or a scientist, but since the onset of Sony coral tissue loss disease, my team, and uh, I will first like to recognize my team, which consists of Joe Hillman, who is my right-hand man and partner in all of these activities, and Carol, um, Carolyn Zofal, who is a paid intern with us, um, so it's a team of exactly three people. Um, next slide. So in 2023, we had the CCT bleaching presentation on September 10th, which gave quite a lot of dire um, reports from around the Caribbean. And on that date, we had had very little signs of bleaching, but we knew that it was coming. So we had been getting prepared. By the 11th, literally the next day, uh, dive masters started to come back and saying, they were seeing signs of paling um, sea nuts and uh, lettuce coral. And we immediately initi initiated a, a four-step intervention program um, trying to protect uh, our, our coral colonies. On the 12th of September, so two days after, we actually shaded our trees. And on the 19th, so eight days later, we pulled those trees into deeper water. And on the 21st, so 10 days after that, we started to shade um, some of our, our, our um, sea nuts uh, on the dive sites. And the last step was uh, Joe in particular went out and started feeding uh, on site, on the coral trees uh, in the nursery, some of our um, diesels. Um, and literally within the nine days of the talk, we were seeing temperatures of 31 degrees Celsius. Next slide. And also the most rapid onset of bleaching that we have ever seen in Dominica. We have been lucky to escape most of the serious bleaching events. And uh, the speed this came on us was was really frightening. And also species like Parides Parides and Agar that we had not seen bleaching before started to bleach. So next slide, please. So our first step was to protect our corals uh, in the nurseries. So this, and by the way, I have to recognize Susie. If you look at the bottom corner here, you see Bin Zhen Gao, um, who helped us, came on board and helped us put, and as we said, put all of our data together and made our data sexy. So we have seven coral trees in the nursery, spread, it in, spread out into two different areas with 286 rescued corals, over 15 species. Um, so our priority was to try and protect these nurseries in step one. Next slide, please. So we immediately started coming up with ideas of how we could do that. And the tree on the left was um, before shading. 
as you see, we had two levels of um, colonies. Uh, the, this was about 10 meters deep. So we removed all the colonies from the top layer and removed them to the bottom layer and put agricultural shading over the top layer in order to shade as best as we could in a, in a short period of time, the lower level of, of colonies. Uh, we're a little worried this year because both levels this year are um, pretty densely covered in coral. So I think we'll have to build separate shading closer and giving them a, a bit more shading over uh, both levels of this tree. And all seven trees we did differently. Next slide, please. This was uh, a very small tree that we set up specifically for some of our diesels. As you can see me, I'm setting it up right here on the left-hand side. On the right, you can see how uh, actually this is my baby and I had nursed this through stony coral tissue loss disease, treated it, healed it, and uh, it had been doing great. And then it completely collapsed and we were not successful in saving it. And you can see the one right next to it was uh, pretty much normal at this point in time. Next tree, next slide, please. And then the next step was to pull these trees down. So as I said, they were at about 10 meters average, the normal depth, but most of them were moored in close to 24, between 18 and 24 meters deep. So it was very easy for us to simply pull these trees down. And here you can see in the very bottom left corner, uh, Joe is down there and he's pulled that tree down and we shaded it. Uh, you see in the foreground uh, only um, a, a cropper a tree, which has 13 um, different um, genotypes of a cropper on it. And then the one tree at the still in, in midwater that we pulled down later. What surprised us was that no matter how deep we went, we could really not find water that was cool enough to make a difference. And even at 32 meters, we were seeing 30 degrees centigrade. So it, we're not sure um, that it did a lot of good, uh, but the combination of shading and depth did definitely help. Next slide, please. So uh, the conclusions from it were, it, if you caught it early, you could definitely protect your um, coral colonies. Uh, if you waited too late, already bleached colonies, it did not allow them to recover. Uh, so most, well, we only had a few, we had five colonies out of 290 that actually ex uh, died because of uh, coral bleaching. So we had a very, very good success record and I'm pretty happy with what we did. And this year, we're definitely going to to do it earlier. Next slide, please. Um, step three, in situ coral feeding. So here you can see, if you play the video, please, you'll see Susie implementing, this is Joe's technique, so I'll give him credit for it. Um, we just built weighted Ziploc bags and then injected coral food into the the bags and then left it for a period of about 10 to 15 minutes while we did other um, chores around the nursery. And every single one of these D cells actually survived the bleaching event. So we feel that it probably was, was beneficial. Next slide, please. Um, and the last step was uh, we built coral shading for CNATs on our dive site. So we shaded 25 CNATs. Uh, we had this done by September 21st. So we quickly moved into uh, building these PVC structures with, um, this is actually just tarpaulins, uh, and all 25 of them survived. So we feel that it made a difference. Uh, it was quite difficult to, to do quickly. We've learned some lessons. Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, uh, conclusions from, from uh, actually this is supposed to be from 2023, but act early. Uh, this seems to be a recurring theme that we're seeing in these presentations. And this year, definitely we're seeing, already seeing um, 29, 30 degrees now. So I think it's time for us to start shading now. Our efforts definitely resulted in increased survivability in the coral nursery uh, in situ. While everyone that we shaded survived, we did not have controls. And by mid-October, oceanic temperatures were starting to drop. So we cannot say conclusively that it was shading that saved them, but the results were positive. Uh, one of our big surprises was that there was very little difference no matter how deep we went. 
Um, and another conclusion that coral feeding seemed to help. Next slide, please. So a question is that we have remaining, uh, if temperatures are not significantly lower in depth, is it necessary for us to lower them and to shade them? So that's a question we need answered. And how deep could we take our pillar corals and for how long could they stay down there if we were continuing to feed them? And are there any existing studies on, on bleached corals uh, and continuing to feed through the bleaching process? The next slide, please, the final slide. Um, we're really happy to say that many of you know that we've struggled financially and, uh, and human resource wise, but we have managed to get approval from our fisheries division uh, and uh, to go ahead and take over this building and put in these uh, XC2 tank systems. So we are frantically building these tanks now and Joe and I, are, it's all under construction right now and uh, all the parts are on their way. And we anticipate that sometime in June, we will have these tanks operational. And we can only hope that uh, they'll be in time for us to, to have a safe haven from the expected bleaching events of 2024. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Simon. That's great to hear that you have a plan. <laughs> and you have triggers. You're just reinforcing all of my, my talking points. Um, the next person we'll hear from is Rachel Ayanada. She's going to talk about feeding corals. Some key considerations here that we identified were literature suggests that feeding in advance of thermal stress can help with resistance and recovery, but feeding after corals are already highly stress stressed may be less successful. Deploying feeding at scale is pretty difficult with the current technology, um, but there are automatic tools that are in development, and that might make this a more feasible response in the future for um, you know, things like entire nurseries or reefs. And I'm going to stop sharing and let Rachel share her screen. Okay, good afternoon. Can everyone see that and hear me? Yep, you're good. Okay, perfect. So, like Ian said, my name is Rachel Ayanada. I am a Coral Restoration Projects Coordinator out of the University of the Virgin Islands. And today I'm gonna to be talking to y'all about determining a feeding Orbicella annularis corals in situ during a thermal bleaching event in the USVI affects their ability to regain pigmentation. So as we saw earlier, 2023 was a big mass bleaching event. Um, if we look at this graph from the Coral Reef Watch from NOAA, we see that this purple squiggly line at the top, I'm not sure if you guys can see my cursor, but this purple squiggly line is sea surface temperature. And here in the USVI, we reached a maximum of 30.6 degrees Celsius. And then from this orange curve, we see that we had 18 degree heating weeks. And furthermore, we had 119 consecutive days at or above the bleaching threshold of 29.4 degrees Celsius which started in late July for us and went through mid-November. Um, whereas for example, the Florida Keys, they started in mid-May. So we kind of were able to see what was happening in Florida and start having conversations amongst ourselves earlier. So one of the conversations we had was, what if we feed in situ? And so we did that here in St. Thomas in Range Key, which is where this red star is. It is also right next to the university. So this made this a really nice study site for us. Um, so we focus on Orbicella annularis. They're commonly known as the lobe star coral. They are reef building stony corals, so they're important. And they're also ESA listed corals. So this made this a really interesting study subject for us. So we went out into Range Key and we found 18 fully bleached Orbicella annularis colonies. And then we divided them into three treatments with six corals per treatment. So six of these corals were covered with bags. They were fed reefoids, which is dried phytoplankton, and coral amino, which is a special blend of amino acids made specifically for corals. And then we left it like this for 30 minutes. The second treatment, the six corals were covered with bags for 30 minutes, but they were not fed. And lastly, the six were our controls. So these were never bagged, nor were they ever fed. So we did this once a week for eight weeks. We did do this during daytime hours as that just aligned with our facilities operating hours. 
And we did start this October 31st of 2023, but the USBI had our thermal maximum on October 5th. That's when we reached that 30.6 degrees Celsius. So this was still done during peak bleaching and peak temperatures. Um, like I said, we had some conversations earlier, but it did take some time, especially being on an island, to get some supplies as well as to get approval and funding and everything to be able to do this project. So that's one thing to keep in mind for this upcoming year. Um, so we were inspired by the in situ probiotics treatment team and we made our own coral feeding entrapment bags. We made ours out of heavy duty plastic garbage bags. It did make them slightly positively buoyant. So we would go out and attach some chain to the opening of the bags, which is what I'm doing right now in this video to secure the bag down on the substrate around the coral. After that was done, we would target feed these corals using syringes with pre-measured food and these hosing lines to target feed the coral. So in a second here, the hose will turn orange as it dispenses the food right there and the coral is target fed. So sometimes you would see the coral initially kind of close its polyps just from having this food wafted over it, but over time it usually did tend to open up. So in addition to feeding each week, we also took top-down framer photos and we did some health metrics like percent bleaching, percent paling, and any percent recent mortality. So we took this data and we ran a repeated measures ANOVA and we found that there was no significant difference amongst treatment. However, there was a significant effect of time. So on this graph in front of you, the left-hand y-axis is percent bleaching, the right-hand y-axis is degrees in Celsius, and the x-axis is the weeks of the treatment. So the fed is in blue, the control is in yellow, and the bag is in orange. And sea surface temperature is this dashed purple line. So you do kind of see as sea surface temperature tends to go down, percent bleaching also tends to go down, which makes overall sense. Um, however, I want to point out, lastly, we kind of noticed visually that these fed corals seem to remain in this bleached or stressed state longer than those who were never fed. And this was really interesting to us. So we ran a chi-square test to see if there was a significant difference in recovery amongst the treatments, and we found that there was no significant difference. Also, we did not have a single coral die during this experiment. So based on this study, we would not recommend feeding Orbicella annularis in situ during a thermal bleaching event as it is not worth the cost. So for us to feed six corals eight times, it costed over $800. And this graph in front of you only includes the consumptive supplies. So this does not include whatever you would need to pay your divers or other staff to do this work. And so if you were to take that into account, you're most likely over $1,000. Lastly, we are continuing to monthly monitor these corals because we're interested to see if there will be a difference come spawning. So there's been a couple studies that show that spawning is either significantly reduced or absent for up to two years following a mass bleaching event. So we'd like to see if there is some difference amongst those who were fed when it comes time for spawning. And if so, we would then recommend that maybe you focus on your keystone species or those main broodstock corals that you visit every year in situ. Um, because like we said earlier, this isn't really something that is mass scalable, at least not right now. So focus on those ones. Um, also for potential further recommendations, we would be interested to see if you were to feed or feed more heavily before the heat wave rolls through. So there's been a few studies too that show that corals tend to not um, take in heterotrophic feeding while they have lost most of their symbionts due to bleaching. So maybe if we feed them before, you can really beef up those energy reserves. And lastly, other species may have different results. So we just saw a talk there where they fed some dendros. So other species might have some kind of different result than Orbicella annularis. So those are our main recommendations from this experiment that we ran. So that takes me to the end and thank you all for listening. Thanks, Rachel. That was great. Uh, next, we'll hear from Matt Davies. He'll talk about nursery evacuation. When considering this response, it's important to acknowledge that it requires a large amount of effort, funding, and preparedness. So focus should be placed on founders, representatives of genotypes, or a percentage of stock rather than um, entire nursery stocks. 
this action should be considered only in severe circumstances and should occur prior to accumulated stress. Facilities that take evacuated corals need suitable, ready-to-use infrastructure, expertise, and space. In Florida, we found that massive corals fared better than branching corals in these evacuation efforts. Transport stress is a factor to consider, especially if corals are already showing signs of stress from the heat. And finally, knowing when to move corals back to a field-based nursery is difficult. Matt, go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you, Matt. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Matt Davis, and I'm the field coordinator at the Nature Conservancy's Coral Hub here in St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, as Caitlin just mentioned, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our efforts to evacuate corals from our field nurseries to our ex situ facility. Next slide, please. So just to set the scene a little bit, as you can see in this chart, a bleach watch was issued for St. Croix around mid-May, uh, with a warning then issued at the beginning of August. Uh, it was around this time we were also starting to see signs of thermal stress, both on the reef and in our nurseries, particularly with our elkhorn and staghorn corals, um, some agarisids and, and uh, some of the parietae species. Uh, and then this combined with the news coming out of Florida regarding the severity of bleaching seen there uh, led us to make the decision to begin removing everything that we could from our field nurseries to our land facility. Uh, evacuations were initiated on August 24th and were completed by September 7th. Next slide, please. So our field nursery inventory at that time consisted of 546 corals housed across three field nurseries. Uh, the majority of our non necropory uh, corals were uh, mostly at one nursery, which uh, was really helpful for us in terms of this evacuation. Uh, so of this total inventory, uh, approximately 40% were those aquaporids, alcorn and staghorn, and, and the remainder were a mix of slower growing species. Uh, primarily brain and star corals. Next slide, please. So in total, uh, 275 corals were evacuated. Unfortunately, at that time, our land-based facility did not have the capability to support acropora corals. Uh, so we were unable to transfer any of these to the land nursery. We were, however, able to relocate around 85% of our non necropid stock uh, any corals with significant ramicrusta growth were left in situ due to concerns about introducing this to our aquaculture systems. Uh, for those of you lucky few who are unfamiliar, uh, ramicrusta is an encrusting red alga uh, that aggressively competes with corals uh, and sort of rapidly overgrows the live tissue of most species. Next slide, please. So the evacuation procedure was fairly straightforward, uh, if a little time consuming. A team of five to six divers uh, removed the substrates from the nursery tables and then lifted them up to the boat in milk crates uh, where they were placed in waiting coolers. Um, water exchanges were completed at least once an hour and a final exchange of water completed just before entering the marina and transferring the corals to our truck. Uh, total transit time from nursery to nursery was approximately one hour. And then uh, upon arrival to the coral hub, we did a slow drip acclimation uh, to prevent shock from the cooler temperatures and the different water quality parameters maintained in our systems. Uh, this was followed by physical removal of unwanted organisms such as the rem crustal that I mentioned, uh, boring sponges, things like that. Finally, uh, we did a 15 minute bath in a dilute iodine solution uh, to disinfect the corals and substrates before introduction to our systems. So while it was fairly straightforward, it was pretty time consuming. Uh, the intake alone took full, two full days uh, with approximately 50 to 60, 70 human hours to complete. Uh, and that does not include the time investment by the old aquaculture keep team to care for these while they were in our facility uh, or the time it took to return them to our field nursery post bleaching. Next slide, please. 
So overall, the inter intervention was a success with almost all of the evacuated corals recovering within one month of intake. Uh, in the photos you can see on the right here, you can see some of the corals when they were brought in, showing some paling and partial bleaching, and the same corals two months later, looking happy, healthy, and growing. Uh, most of the corals that were, were returned to the nursery in December and January, with the remainder either outplanted at Buck Island last month, uh, or further fragmented to replenish our stock. In contrast, we saw approximately 50% mortality in our non acroporid stock that remained in the field nursery, although some of them showed little signs of stress at all. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so one of the major challenges we faced and definitely the most devastating was our inability to evacuate any of our acroporid corals. Uh, we had over 18% mortality of these species, including the complete loss of our two Alcorn orchards, uh, which had uh, over 40 unique genets in each, and these were fairly large colonies. So it was very sad. Um, we also had almost complete mortality of our 21 staghorn domes, which you can see here on the top left. Um, and that's quite a significant amount of material. Each of those is about two meters in diameter. Uh, in addition, the removal process itself was very time consuming. We were lucky that our field nurseries were only partially stocked at this time, uh, or we would have likely had to leave a greater proportion in situ. Uh, I mentioned Ramicrusta briefly earlier, uh, the encrusting red alga that has invaded our nursery. Uh, you can see it here in this bottom left photo, uh, that sort of orange algae that's overgrowing the agaricia shown. Um, of the corals that were left in situ, uh, because they had this uh, ramacrusta growth on them, uh, the, a lot of those that did, um, didn't make it through actually succumbed mostly to the ramacrusta overgrowth rather than th thermal stress, uh, although it may have been a combination of both. Uh, record keeping during the evacuations was a challenge. Uh, we initially began with our usual process of keeping detailed written records as we removed corals from our nursery. Uh, it quickly became apparent that we needed to move much faster if we were going to be able to remove everything we wanted to in the time that we had. Uh, so we resorted to just using photo evidence, and unfortunately we lost most of those photos after uh, one of the SD cards became corrupted. Finally, we were also dealing with a large sargasm influx uh, in the lagoon right outside of our land facility, uh, and that caused water quality issues near our intake pipe, which led to ammonia spikes and ciliate in outbreaks inside of our systems, um, which unfortunately caused some mortality in the corals that we did bring in, especially the ones that were the most stressed. Next slide, please. Okay, so future planning or sort of lessons learned. Um, definitely this year and, and into the future, we plan to initiate our inter interventions earlier. So we're a little bit less rushed and can slow down a bit and keep record records. Um, our land systems are now capable of supporting necroporic corals, which is great news. Um, we have already began transferring representative samples of these into the land facility. You can see some of those in the photo on the left. Um, we have also decided that if space and time are limiting, we will prioritize genetic diversity over volume uh, so that we have at least one representative from each genet in our land nursery, especially considering some of the corals that remained in situ did not show any visible signs of thermal stress throughout the event. So uh, it's unclear whether the transfer of some of the corals we brought in was actually necessary and perhaps we could have um, better prioritized our time. Uh, finally, and, and maybe my biggest takeaway for anyone planning to do this sort of thing in the future, uh, we have made some modica modifications to our nursery design and substrate attachment methods uh, that will make it much easier and quicker to transfer corals between nurseries en masse in the event of future bleaching or other acute events such as hurricanes. So uh, the new system we have set up allows us to remove about six, six to seven substrates at a time rather than one by one. Uh, that concludes my presentation, so thank you all for listening, and please let me know if you have any questions. Thanks, Matt. And the final action that we'll hear about is ex-situ genetic banking, which will be presented by Logan Williams. 
Some of the key considerations that we identified are, again, to focus on founding populations, a few representatives of genotypes or a percentage of stock. There was an effort in Florida, Florida to understand the genetics amidst the gene banking emergency. And we would recommend that when implementing this, it's more important to get the corals to safekeeping and then genetic analysis can be conducted again later. This also ties back to the big picture recommendation about building redundancy into programs and where possible genetic banking should be should take place on a rolling basis and not in the middle of an emergency. Uh, Logan, go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Logan Williams. I am the coral scientist at Cori, located in St. Thomas. And today I'm going to give a brief summary of the ex situ coral bleaching intervention efforts we attempted this last bleaching season. Next slide, please. In the early months of 2023, we undertook a critical mission funded by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to rescue diseased corals, specifically pillar corals, for ex situ treatment and rehabilitation. This endeavor lasted from January to May of 2023 and was wrapping up about a month before a bleach watch was issued for the territory. We anticipated a potentially catastrophic bleaching season, so we immediately began um, strategizing possible intervention actions for our rescued and rehabilitated pillar coral broodstock. Next slide, please. However, we faced several challenges. One, our nursery facility was located outdoors, so we had little control over ambient environmental conditions. We were using an open saltwater system. The raceway water was pulled directly from the ocean, and we did not have access to chillers, aquarium chillers at the time, so we had very little ability to regulate and control our raceway water temperatures. Next slide, please. Um, despite these obstacles, we implemented various strategies or attempted to mitigate attempting to mitigate the challenges we were facing during this bleaching event. So um, we knew we couldn't control for water temperature. So we decided to reduce the radiance and installed pop-up tents equipped with adjustable drawstring tarps for controlled shading over our raceways. Um, an augmented feeding regimen was implemented to counteract reduced light effects from the shading. The corals were fed a diet consisting of Artemia, copepods, mysis shrimp, rotifers, spirulina, golden pearls and amino acid supplements regularly. And each coral was target fed approximately two to four milliliters of this concentrated food mixture. Um, and in an attempt to try to cool our uh, raceway water temperature, we actually ended up installing tabletop fans over the raceways and then positioning our power heads upward to enhance water circulation and try to facilitate some type of cooling effect. Next slide, please. Um, so what were our key observations? Well, we did see resilience in our pillar coral broodstock. Um, although it was early in the bleaching season, but the corals did show reproductive activity in August, releasing both male and female gametes. And we observed lower levels of thermal stress um, in our broodstock compared to other corals on property and within the same nursery. Next slide, please. Um, however, we did face some serious challenges. Um, this was really labor intensive and fatigue inducing work. We were exposed to high temperatures ranging from 100 to 112 degrees Fahrenheit and high levels of humidity in certain situations. Um, the elevated nutrient levels from that augmented feeding regimen demanded increased maintenance efforts to clean the corals and the raceways, took time away, time and effort away um, from focusing on other important husbandry, husbandry tasks. And then we also experienced psyllid outbreaks in November and December, which were possibly linked to the heightened feeding rates. And also, you know, our corals, they definitely did, they were exposed to thermal stress. They were experiencing stress. They may not have shown visible signs, but we knew that they were compromised. Next slide, please. So with those challenges, um, we do have some future recommendations, aquarium chillers. So um, if I were to do this uh, work again, I would install aquarium chillers. And I think that in addition to that increased shading, um, we would have had uh, enhanced temperature regulation. Our corals would have um, fared a little better. The deployment of industrial fans within the facility to ensure comfortable and safe working conditions for our staff, because like I said, we were exposed to really high um, heat stress and you know heat exhaustion is always um, is always a risk in those situations. 
we would definitely adjust our feeding regimen either by reducing um, or diluting the concentration of food mix we were feeding the corals or reducing the frequency of feedings. Um, and I think that that would have helped us control those nutrient spikes better. And then finally, um, I really wish we could have been prepared for that ciliate outbreak. And so the establishment of a ciliate management plan um, should be put forth to prevent and mitigate, mitigate outbreaks um, that could happen in the future. Next slide, please. And in addition to that, uh, we were actually really uh, fortunate to receive NOAA funding to establish a coral genetic and propagation arc at Cori. Um, and we will be utilizing this facility for future bleaching intervention work. It is The facility is located indoors. Um, it is climate controlled. It is fitted with independent recirculating life support systems that run off of artificial salt water and the life support equipment and the water chemistry and parameters within these systems are controlled and monitored using the Neptune Apex system. So we have much more control over the environmental conditions the corals are experiencing. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, with that, I would like to thank Corey, the organization I work for, um, Noah and Nifwith for providing the funding to do this work, and then also the Virgin Islands Coral Disease Advisory Committee. Thanks everyone. Thank you, that was great. Um, so I just wanna take a moment to thank all our speakers. This was a ton of information. Um, I don't manage a nursery anymore, but I think this will be so useful to people that are thinking about what to do this summer um, to have all these lessons learned compiled uh, in one webinar. I just wanted to share a couple other potentially useful resources. Um, a Reef Manager's Guide to Coral Bleaching, which was published by NOAA, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority and IUCN. Um, a coral bleaching toolkit that was just published recently by the Coral Reef Alliance. And then I've included a link here. You can't see the link, but we'll make sure everybody gets this um, to some of the products that Derek talked about earlier. Um, and with that, we're going to open it up for questions. I think Dana has been tracking questions in the chat. Um, and you can also feel free at this point to raise your hand if you want to ask a question um, directly. And it can be for any of the speakers. So. Okay, so while we're waiting for folks to raise hands or generate new questions, I'll go back. We have a couple questions that came in for uh, Carlos um, about the shading project in Puerto Rico. Um, Kate Rodriguez Clark asks, thank you for showing this interesting work. Was it possible to control or at least randomize genotypes across treatments? If not, what do you think the effect of genotype might have been in this study, if any? So um, we have no control of the genotype. We don't know exactly with how many genotypes you're working with. We know that many of these uh, corals that we're using came from different reef, not just Culebra, but you know, nearby Vieques, another, another reef. So I can't say anything about the genotype. Um, but I would say that um, we can somehow identify corals that withstand uh, higher temperatures and mark them and follow them through time. And perhaps we can fragment them and use it more often in our farms, thinking that these are genotypes that are very much more uh, suited to withstand high temperatures than other. But like I said, at the you know, the, you know genomic uh, or, or at the uh, gene level, we, I can't, I can't say much about it. Okay, and one more quick question for you, Carlos. Um, one of the uh, participants wanted to know if they, read correctly in your slide that the highest degree of shading actually demonstrated the highest temperature uh, readings in your shallow um, in your shallow data set. What was again that portion? No, no. Could on, did, could understand. did the highest degree of shading have the highest temperatures? Yeah. All right. So the thing there was that the, we have malfunctioning devices in that farm 
and some of the data that we were planning to collect were lost because of the malfunctioning of the device. And perhaps that's the that's the trick there that we I, I know I understand the question now, but the um I think with a better device or or very higher quality device that, that doesn't broke in the middle of the experiment, we may be able to um um somehow determine if high temperatures are associated with low solar radiation or otherwise. But it's just uh, I think what was, what what went wrong there was a device that were wrong that uh, the the device that uh, get broke. Okay, thanks, Carlos. Um, Rachel, you got a couple questions that you addressed in the chat, but I was wondering if you wanted to share with everyone. You got some questions about whether or not you thought it would have made a difference to conduct the feeding experiments at night um, and wondering at, at what depth the, uh, the Ursella annularis um, colonies were when you fed them. Yes. Um, feeding at night may have made a difference. It's hard for me to say that, you know, a certainty, because this was kind of a reactionary experiment for us. We did not take samples to run any kind of lipid analysis to see if there was a difference in the lipid content of those who are being fed and those who weren't. So it would also be interesting to take samples like that in the future. Um, feeding at night might also make a difference. So it would potentially be interesting to replicate the same thing at night and see if there is a significant difference between the two experiments. Um, I also would recommend uh, for people to read the paper by Gratoli et al, The Heterotrophic Plasticity and Resilience in Bleached Corals. It was a really interesting paper. It showed that some corals change uh, the amount of heterotrophic feeding during bleaching. And sometimes even without symbionts, they won't heterotrophically feed given food. So it might also be a very species specific response. So maybe you know, brain corals or dendros or something would have a different response to being fed while bleached than Forbicella nilaris. I'm not entirely sure, but I think there's definitely some different renditions of this that could be really interesting to try and see what happens. Um, we might try one or two different things. We're currently, unfortunately, in a bleach watch in St. Thomas right now, so we have been talking about further experiments for bleaching intervention, including potentially some more feeding follow-ups. So, um, yeah, I can let you know in a couple of months, potentially. So, but thank you for the questions. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I guess for all of you, Simon Walsh wanted to know if anyone has best practices for ciliate management. It seems a common issue and we've been warned about it as we set up our ex situ system. And there's some discussion in the chat here about installing UV filters. Um, and also, um, Simon asked about, about using an iodine soak on incoming corals. So I don't know if any of the speakers have any, have any thoughts on best practices for ciliate management. Um, I can make a small comment if you want. Sure, please. I'm also, yeah, a husbandry person. I've been doing it since 2019. Um, we have done peroxides. So sometimes if it's a coral that you can take out of the system and we even use Q-tips dip and peroxide and directly treat, that helps. I know that there's some different peroxide concentrations for doing baths on corals. So that'd be something to look into. Mm -hmm. Also, whenever we bring in corals from the field, doing some kind of dip, whether it's um, an RO freshwater dip for 30 seconds or using iodine or... Um, I blank in the name of it, but there's another coral bath that's specifically made for that. And then isolating mm -hmm. them in another tank for about a month just to make sure that they aren't bringing mm -hmm. any kind of unwanted critters from the field mm -hmm. is usually one way to kind of mitigate or reduce as well. Thanks, Rachel. Um, if, if everyone, if you're not speaking, could please keep your microphone on mute. Um, Caitlin, I have one more question in the chat um, from Emma Doyle with MPA Connect. Thank you for the excellent presentations and helpful summaries. From a management perspective, there's always interest in knowing the triggers that justify action and investment. Several presenters have mentioned that they would advise acting earlier. Are there any further comments on this or suggested triggers 
for particular actions linked with the updated Coral Reef Watch alert levels. Anyone have any thoughts in response to that question? Specific indicators, triggers that, that you would use to make decisions to act earlier in the future? Uh, here, here in Dominica, we're we're seeing temperatures almost at the threshold of the start of bleaching. So, my assumption is that although we're only May thirteenth, we we never seen bleaching in Dominica before September. Um, that the temperature might be the trigger right now for starting these interventions right now. Actually, so that's that's what we're thinking from. It's a simple temperature trigger. Thanks, Simon. Anyone else want to respond to that one? Um, yeah, hey, I just want you know, I think Simon's absolutely right. I think uh, it's imperative that <clears throat> you keep track of um, the day to day sea, sea surface temperatures at your particular location. Um, and, you know, if you're already hitting thresholds, months in advance of typical bleaching season, then I think it's a good time to start getting things in place. And, uh, you know, once once heat stress starts accumulating, then I think that's when you really need to pull the trigger and be ready to pull the trigger at that point. Thanks, Derek. Any other questions out there? Oh, we have some hands up. Dave Vaughn. Uh Yes, I just wanted to comment on the previous one is that last year we had people uh, scramble during the event to try to find land based alternatives, which was as everybody suggested a little late. Now we're talking about trying to get it early on in the heating event, which is good, but, uh, but I'd like to look at something that has land based facilities year round, rather than even just right before it starts. And I think you could plan a system where you provided uh, corals to all field-based nurseries on a year-round basis, and they could, you know, move a large number of viable genotypes as well as production units after a hot spell and be planning for it year-round rather than definitely not during a, a bleaching event. And a uh, question just right before a bleaching event is a little too late. Let's look at it as a as the new normal. And we have a comment, Dave, that, that Moats Coral Gene Bank has such a facility. Um, Judy, your hands up. Thank you, Dana. I, I was just going to follow up on Simon's question and, and Derek's response, because I wanted to ask him, um, when you start seeing the water temperatures heat up, um, what resource do you use? Because you're a good example of a of a historically resource poor facility. Um, is the Eastern Caribbean um, data products from the NOAA Coral Reef Watch telling you when in the Eastern Caribbean the bleaching threshold uh, is normally reached of any use? Or do you have anything, uh, any kind of data logger yourself on site at Soufrière? Or, or are you just using your um, diving watches uh, with the uh, with their um, temperature? Yeah, you thanks. Know, your, your diving computers, I beg your pardon. Let me get modern with the terminology. Yeah, thanks, Judy. You, um, you and I have had this conversation about how very unreliable diving computers are um, and huge variations. So what uh what joe does every day when he's diving on the nursery we we actually um we don't leave the hobos out we actually um, activate them right before the dive um and then record the temperature from the hobo right after the dive so we're sort of using them as a as a dive by dive indication of temperature um we don't actually look at any external resources for temperature uh, we're in the water every day and obviously our local situation is what we really need to know. So all we use is the, the hobo data and we record that every day. Okay, thank you very much. 
Okay, a couple more questions have come in through the chat. Um, Jackie with Coral Reef Watch asks, we keep, at NOAA Coral Reef Watch, we keep getting the question as to what in-water partners and users are doing in the field now when bleaching alert levels three to five are predicted, so the higher levels. Does anyone have comments about actions that they and their networks have been planning in revised bleaching response plans for those most extreme levels of heat stress? Anyone wanna highlight anything different than the, the actions we've been discussing here today? Hi, I'm not hearing a lot more, Jackie. I think this is these are the things that people are trying with the the to deal with, you know, the the heat stress events in in general. So Dana, sorry, I muted you by accident. I was trying to unmute myself. I think Lisa wanted to respond to that. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't see a hand go up, so. Sorry, thank you all. I joined late, I was in another Zoom. Um, so you may have covered this. So we're looking at uh, turbidity or natural shading uh, as to who, who survived last year versus who didn't. And so rather than moving, because uh, we have everything in situ in nurseries, nothing land-based, rather than moving deeper nurseries, we've just moved one to uh, naturally turbid area where there are some wild staghorn that, that made it through last year. And so we have two genets that live in this near shore turbid water. And whilst they're not thriving like the larger stands that we still have elsewhere, they made it through. So that's the only difference. I don't know if you guys talked about natural shading and turbidity versus temperature. I just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. We didn't highlight that, Lisa. Thank you. Um, okay, and then final question, it looks like for practitioners to do not have information on the genotypes they hold, what resources are available for connecting them up with those with the genotyping capability to get those collections inventoried for management? So I just want to, there's some good, good responses here in the chat um, from Steph Schottmeyer with Florida Fish and Wildlife. So I wanted to highlight her responses. And um, if you're interested in this, scroll down. Uh, Steph recommends to have them contact Alicia Vollmer also with Florida FWC to discuss options for, for genotyping. And that's all we've got in the chat, Caitlin. Okay. Um, well, just once again, I wanna thank everyone for joining us. Um, and I but, think but don't I go yet. turn it back over to Judy. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, don't leave yet. Um, okay. First, I want to thank our speakers today. Derek gave us a very forceful introduction to the warm temperatures that are currently affecting most of the Caribbean basin, which is scary. And also to our other speakers from the controlled intervention experiments of um, the uh, Sociedad Ambiente uh, Marino in Puerto Rico and from the University of the Virgin Islands, especially Rachel's frank assessment of the relative worth of her efforts to the no spare resources to sacrifice anything as a control that was given, what that was demonstrated by uh, Simon in the field in Dominica and by um, uh, Logan in uh, St. Thomas in, in the lab. And the regretful sacrifice of all those acroporids in the uh, fragments uh, underwater in St. Croix because of lack of, of facilities for, for maintaining them. I hope everybody has experienced a little of the fear and resourcefulness that characterized all these responses to the 2023 bleaching event last year, and heard something of their plans for improvement in 2024, if and when the need arises. So really, 
my profound appreciation to all our speakers. And then for anyone who can stay on after the, the uh, 1.30 magic hour, which we're supposed to finish, Lisa Karn, is, who is already here and has talked already, um, is going to share with us um, some of her recent videos of the, what I call it a hope oasis. It's more than a hope spot, it's an oasis. The acropores that have survived from her outplantings over the last decade in the Southern uh, Belize Lagoon and which received no intervention treatment last year and which most of which nevertheless survived. So Lisa somehow knows what she's doing and um, if she could have the screen share, y'all are you know welcome to leave if you have to, but you're invited to stay on for another five or 10 minutes if you can spare the time. Lisa. I cannot share my screen yet, Judy. You can't share your screen? No. Uh-oh. Shirley, can you please? OK. Um, yes, I'm sorry. Who is it? Um... Lisa. Lisa, Lisa Karn. Karn C-A-R-N-E. I got it. Hold on. So in the meantime, Judy's correct. We did zero interventions. But let me preface that by saying we've doing this work since uh, 2006, really, our initial transplants. And as we stepped it up uh, in 2009, 2010, the premise of our work has been identifying the more what we consider thermally tolerant uh, corals and moving those around in various areas. I'm still unable to share the screen. I know. I'm trying to find you, Lisa. Um, oh, dear. OK. We know she's here. But Judy has access as well. Before we lose everybody, um, Caitlin has access on the drive. If she can't, oh, okay. Find sorry, it. here you go. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Okay, all right. So I'm doing the order Judy asked. I was going to do a different order. Um, this first video, I don't think there's any audio, so I could just talk over it. And it was really just to give people some hope. This is from last Friday at Cell Silk Keys. Oh, it's not playing. Is it playing for you? Can you? Oh, oh, shucks. Sorry about that. There's music. Let me turn that down. There we go. You so, can't hear the music, Lisa. Oh, great. Um, mm -hmm. You can hear me, though, right? Yep. Yeah, so we were at um, what we call South Silk Keys. I'm sorry I didn't throw up a map first. It's near the uh, Main Barrier Reef in Southern Belize. What you're seeing now are elkhorns that were outplanted between 2019 and um, 2022. Um, the staghorn and the prolifera were outplanted earlier. I'm hearing some background noise. Is that coming from December to so this is just a short video. All of this is acropores that we outplanted um, many, many years ago. They did bleach and they are not bleaching now whilst other things are. Anularis is bleaching now. Parietes Parietes is bleaching now. Uh, we are also in bleaching watch in Belize, I believe. Um, the second video you asked, Judy, was the staghorn one. Yes, I think. Um, I open them all up. Yeah, this one. So this is very recent from the east side of Laughingburg Key. What's happening? I lost you guys. Can you see anything? Can you see my screen with a different screen yep. now? Okay. Yep. So so this first um set is during the bleaching event on the east side of Laughingburg Key. I hope you can't hear the doom and gloom music on it. So I was certain there would be mortality, and there was. We were not 100% unscathed, but we do have almost 20 different, see the dead corals here from just May gone, uh, early May. But then we also have a lot more living staghorn than um, dead staghorn. And I've had trouble quantifying this. I'm open to suggestions. We are doing 
photomosaics, drone orthomosaics. Again, these corals have been out since 2010, so they've just naturally spread into these huge stands. These are healthy. It's a little glary because it was midday the other day. But so it's just showing that there is still lots of living. Um, in fact, Tom Moore was here on a holiday and he said there's more staghorn at Laughingburg Key than all of Florida put together. I don't know if that's an exaggeration, but um, then I threw in some elkhorn because those are my favorite. So again, most of these corals did suffer and um, bleached um, starting in um, June and through November. And I was pleasantly surprised. What was the um, next order, Judy? That um, that many survived. I was gonna do the time series one, but you want the less Bev and less one? The time series one I spent a lot of time on. I wonder if I opened it. Yeah, let me do the time series one because that has um, multiple time series from the same palmata set. So you guys seeing this screen now? So these were microfragments that were outplanted and you're seeing the screen, the 2018, 2019. Yes. Um, they were outplanted as tiny little microfragments. Um, David Bond's uh, modified uh, methodology, uh, skipping the nursery. They also spawned in 2022, but then of course they did bleach. Is it plain? It's plain. They did bleach in um, um, last year. This is from November partially bleached and then now this is just from early May pretty much fully recovered little mortality sorry about the poor res we have time series from some corals going back to 06 and this one um, bleached severely and then now is has some partial mortality but pretty much recovered also from 06 um, I thought this was going to go too but it's actually if you'll see the next image unscathed virtually unscathed very little partial mortality that is not the same for all the different colonies. So this one was, I think, 2013, partial mortality in November, by November. Um, and this was just the other day, and we stuck a temp logger on it. And uh, this was Judy's favorite image of genetic diversity. It didn't work out well for this set. Um, and then just uh, in May, you can see like the middle one that survived kind of collapsed. Again, we've had some structural issues um, outside of the bleaching issues. So this same set here uh, had some structural damage, but you can see that they're recovered and very little partial mortality. This one I thought for sure was gonna go and it stayed like fully bleached like this almost through November, but look at this, most of it recovered. Again, there's partial mortality and I've talked to Ileana and others about this and it's like the flat surface areas so I think there's a lot to do with the light versus the temperature. And look at the recovery here. This was what we call the losing one um, that we've been monitoring for a while. Sorry for the poor resolution, but there's actually some pieces hanging on whether or not any survives. We have most of these genets outplanted in multiple places. We have before last year's event over 30 palmata genets. This is at Laughingburg Key National Park and about 20 different staghorn genets and around five different proliferogenets. And so there's a gradation of um, totally unscathed, a little bit totally dead, and then everything in between. So see here again, very little partial mortality. Um, and I think there's more to it than just genetic diversity. As I mentioned, I think there's local current action, um, turbidity issues. This is two different genets over time series that kind of held their bleaching pattern and the shape that they have. Um, so again, I spent a lot of time trying to give you guys an idea of just some of these time series that we have. We have a lot more um, and I wanted to share that with you. Now, this last bit is a site that never really bleached any at all in the Southwest point of Laughingburg Key. And we think that one of the reasons may be because it has a confluence of currents on the Southwest point and it's often turbid there. So again, that's why I mentioned the turbidity as sort of a natural shading um, effect uh, versus just temperature issues when it comes to the extreme events that we had. Should I share any more or is that enough? Do you wanna see the interview with um, Les and, and, and Bev or are we good, Judy? Anybody? 
<laughs> I know that was really quick. I was trying to be really fast. You're on mute. Uh, Judy's having trouble with her mute button. Oh, there. No, <clears throat> Judy forgot her mute button. I, I think we've probably seen enough um, for today. Um, and I'm and I wanted you to save that one for the end because I thought by by the time you came to showing that people would really start to appreciate what it more fully what it is that you're accomplishing, having seen some of the shorter vignettes from other places. Um, it's obviously a huge amount of work that she has undertaken, but um, the payoff is that by choosing learning where the optimal sites are and the optimal genotypes are and starting to understand the environment, the specific environmental parameters in her area that are most favorable for Acroporas, she's getting these incredible results. And that laughing bird key area with all the uh, Acroporas cervicornis, um, how big is it, Lisa, a couple of hectares? Um, from the from the drone um, ortho mosaics, we have about a hectare of shallow fringing reef, um, and over twenty percent of that prior to the bleaching event was restored acroporids. We need to update that. Um, the only real data that I could share for mortality is from uh, palmata specifically from moho and silks because I could still count there. So at moho and silks, we began doing the direct outplanting with the microfragments. Um, in 2019 and both sites, Dave Vaughn came down for that first training course at Moho Key. Um, Dave Vaughn, those first, those, um, first um, palmatas are still living. They made it through. So at Moho Key, I think we had just under 500 palmata colonies of various sizes. I did size classes of uh, microfragments, meaning they hadn't fused yet, under 30 centimeter, 30 to 60 centimeter, 60 to 90, and over 90. And of our outplanted um, palmata colonies, we had just around 6%, 100% mortality. So very little 100% mortality. It's difficult to calculate the variations in the partial mortality. So I haven't gotten there yet. And of course, it's, I can't count the staghorn. So we've got to come up with a different way to quantify that. But good news. And then also the wild colonies at Moho fared worse. And um, so I can be more specific at Silk Keys where we have 342 elkhorn outplants since 2019. We did not do any microfragments um, last year, 2023 at Silk Keys. We had only 4% total mortality. And at that same site, we had exactly 11 wild colonies of palmata and they had over 30%, 100% mortality. So that's the only real quantitative numbers I have for now. I'm, I'm really trying to wrap my mind around how to do the staghorn and or bird because laughing bird has so much more corals than these other sites and for so much longer. So I think I'm going to have to stick with the diver based mosaics and the drone ortho mosaics to get quantitative numbers um, for the for those. Um, I guess I could have said it in a more positive way. It would be what 96 percent survivorship at silks and um, and um what, what is that? 100 minus 6, uh, um, 90 what? 94 percent at Moho Key, again, for the outplanted elk horns only. And again, I'm only talking about 100 percent dead. I'm not talking about the partial mortality. But even for us, uh, with partial mortality, we consider it a win because we are already seeing regrowth on the ones that were affected, uh, as you saw in some of the time frames and time series images they're already beginning to recover, but what this year will bring, nobody knows, right? And we are also not planning any interventions this year, except for what I briefly mentioned with the, the new table installation in a more turbid area. So we'll not be moving, we'll not be shading. And again, the premise of our work for over almost two decades now has been that we've kind of done the homework and we're hoping that, that we make it through this year. But We'll be sure to share the updates as, as we go along, Judy. Thanks again for inviting me, as you always do. Thank, thank you, Lisa. I think Derek said it best in the chat. This is the best news I've heard about the Caribbean since last June, he wrote with an exclamation mark. And, um, and with that, I think it's time to uh, wish everybody a very happy Monday, afternoon with what's left of it and we're so glad 
that um, you could join us today, especially those who were able to stay through to the end. So thank you very much, um, audience as well as speakers. And hold the thought, you, it can be better. Thanks again, Judy, and thanks everyone in the comments and um, have a great day.